Hello and good morning everyone and thank you for joining our Citrix Workspace Suite webinar today. Uh, so we're joined here by Lyndon John Martin, Systems Engineer from Citrix. Um, you can just see his picture just there. And uh, we also have Jamie Wood, our Virtualization and EUC Specialist here at Bytes. Thanks Amy and good morning everybody. As Amy said, my name is Jamie Wood and I'm part of the Virtualization and EUC team here at Bytes. I've been at Bytes for nearly six months now and work closely with our tier one vendors such as Citrix. Thank you all for taking the time out to join us today on the Citrix Workspace Suite webinar and hopefully you'll find it useful. Um, before I pass you over to LJ, I'd like to touch very briefly on the Bytes and Citrix relationship and where Bytes sit. So Bytes are a top five Citrix Gold partner with more than 15 years experience working alongside Citrix. We have a dedicated in-house virtualization and EUC team that includes software licensing specialists such as myself. Uh, alongside us, we have a team of technical resources that can work with our customers to scope and deliver projects. My contact details will be listed at the end of the webinar, so feel free to get in touch with any questions or queries you may have. And now I'll pass road to LJ from Citrix to discuss the Workspace Suite offering. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, Amy, just to confirm, you can see my screen okay? Yes, we can see your screen. Sure, brilliant. <clears throat> okay, well, good morning everyone. So, uh, my name is Lyndon John Martin. Uh, you can call me LJ, uh, depending on if you're going to drop messages into the chat box or not. LJ, Lyndon, Lyndon John, whatever you prefer. Uh, I'm a systems engineer at Citrix, uh, which means that I do technical pre-sales uh, for Citrix. Uh, I look after the channel, uh, so I have quite a strong relationship with Bytes and many of our other partners out there uh, delivering these sorts of events. So today we're going to be talking about uh, Citrix Workspace Suite and the context of what it can do and how it can help your organization. Uh, before we get there, I've, got, I've also got a very brief agenda, so we'll just go about what you can expect to get out of today's session. Uh, why is Citrix? I've got a very good uh, short case study which actually demonstrates the power around our technologies and that we're not just uh, all about products, we're actually about a solution. Then obviously what is our mobile workspace vision and concept and then I've got a few demonstrations and then finishing off with uh, some promotions. Uh, thereafter I'll hand back to Bites and then we can have a Q&A section and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, please feel free to obviously drop those questions into the chat window, uh, two bytes, uh, they can collect all of them, those that are similar, we can then, uh, they can be answered uh, to me and then obviously we can answer those appropriately. Right, so let's kick off. So a bit about today and what, what you can expect. So um, let's just build this out quickly. So obviously we want to think about, uh, well you may be a customer that wants to understand how to embrace mobility, virtualization, potentially cloud networking, um, or you could be ready to begin your, journey, your organization's journey to obviously a next generation workspace. So that could entail um, reducing the number of buildings that you have per site, taking your existing office and actually re changing the way it looks and feels in terms of creating hot desks and replacing a lot of the dedicated offices into more usable areas where people can collaborate and work. Uh, as well and how they are needed or required. Um, or you could be just yet to learn more about Workspace Suite and how it can actually help your organization. So maybe you've heard a bit of or seen a bit of the marketing that's been out there over the internet or via bots. Uh, or you could be an existing Citrix customer who's looking to potentially upgrade to Workspace Suite from, as an example, Presentation Server or Zen App, fronted by an access gateway or secure gateway. Or you could be completely new and just wanting to understand who and what Citrix actually do. Um, so I think let's start with the why Citrix. So Citrix is an organization that's over 25 years old. Uh, we're essentially a company of acquisition. So what that means is along the way, we've had our core offering, which is the ability to deliver, to deliver secure applications and desktops uh, to any location, any time, anywhere. But along the way, we've made very strategic acquisitions that have enabled and allowed us to actually uh, grow our portfolio, expand our uh, use case in terms of what we can actually do for our customers, making sure that we always ensure the customer comes first in whatever way, shape uh, and form that may take. Likewise, also the premise of allowing people to work from any location, uh, from anywhere, that's been one of our core messaging for over 25 years. So in terms of some of these acquisitions, we've had the ability to obviously share data through the acquisition of ShareFile, the ability to control devices through the capabilities of 
MDM, all the way through to acquisitions such as NSA, which gave us a hypervisor, all the way through to, I think, one of the more well-known acquisitions is around Netscaler, which gives us the ability to obviously not just do, uh, or actually not just compete in the application delivery content space, uh, but also compete in terms of remote access, and obviously making sure that any applications or resources that are delivered through Citrix are optimized, made secure, and obviously it's just seamless and transparent to the user. Now, if we take a look at the actual content, if we take that, what I've just talked about and put that into context, if we actually take a look at where the market is today in terms of one or two different, should we say, segments of the market in terms of silos. So this is not the complete market uh, that you'd actually see today, so we'll just pick on a, a handful of them. So all the way through around to mobility and identity management, through to mobile network access control. Obviously, Zen App and Zen Desk are bringing in that capability to do desktop and app virtualization all the way through to social and web collaboration with our go-to products. The market segment is fairly fragmented within reason. You have uh, many different vendors out there that have one or more uh, product offerings or solution offerings that can obviously be dropped into those different uh, tiers or silos. However, Citrix is one of the only vendor, a few vendors that is actually strategically across the whole stack end to end. So for us, it doesn't really make a difference whether what type of application it may be, whether it be a native mobile application, whether it be a Windows application that we have repurposed and retasked to be delivered out to the user, whether that just be a, a typical Windows published application or a virtual desktop, whether that be a server-based desktop or a Windows-based desktop in terms of Windows 7 or Windows 8, or even Windows 10 as we move forward. But if you take a look at the Citrix stack, across the stack end-to-end, -end, we have things like Zen Mobile, which gives us our mobility offering around delivering and controlling uh, mobile devices, whether they be smartphones or tablets, securing native mobile applications so we can actually control things like uh, the network fabric, the application fabric, all the way through into things like um, content management systems, uh, sorry, sorry uh, uh, mobile information or content management around ShareFile, which gives you the ability to have what we call follow me data. So that means I can create a presentation uh, from my virtual desktop, save that to my ShareFile folder, and instantaneously gain access to that document on any one of your devices that I'm uh, any one of your, number one of your devices that you potentially use on a daily basis. Or I could potentially flip across to my, either my tablet or my smartphone and actually connect to that actual file, open it up, and potentially edit it. So you'll see a couple of examples of these later on as we move through the presentation, getting towards the demonstration side of things. And obviously, fundamentally, in terms of what we actually do, Netscale is a very critical and crucial part of the whole solution, uh, which underpins what we call uh, the Citrix mobile workspace, which is essentially powered by something we call X1, uh, or it's more of a concept. Uh, there's many different phrases or words out there, but it's something that I like to call X1, which I'll touch on and talk about in a moment. But essentially, Netscaler is seamless, transparent, and gives, gives the users the ability to access resources on demand in a secure manner. Now, the problem and the challenge is whenever you introduce more security, typically what happens is you'll notice that experience goes down while performance and sorry, security goes up. Now, in terms of a Netscaler, what we try and do there is to make sure that whenever you put a solution in, Typically with Netscaler, we would like to make sure that we keep the user experience equal, if not actually accelerate it and push it upwards, and we can achieve that through Netscaler. Obviously through to uh, delivering our resources with Zen App and Zen Desktop and collaboration with our go-to go -to meeting and Podio services. So I, I touched and I mentioned on what is X1. So X1 is all about what we call experience first. So we're always going to be focusing on the end users to make sure that their experience is as, is as positive as possible, seamless and transparent. Also, part of the problem we've had over the number of years is if you look in context of how you access resources through Citrix, you potentially go in through a web interface, which obviously we've now replaced with Storefront, and potentially you can you can brand all of that up and make it look like your organization's colors, put your own logo in. Now, if I was to come in through an agent, i.e. something called Citrix Receiver, and I connect it to that same uh, interface, I get something like green bubbles. So it's a bit of a bit of a bit confusing for users. They see green bubbles on one hand, on the other hand, they see something completely different. So what we've actually done with our latest release of quite a few of our products is we've actually now enabled uh, X1 across the stack. So it means it doesn't make a difference whether I come in from a smartphone, a tablet. PC, a Mac, or even a Linux-based desktop, I get the exact same consistent look and feel across the whole, uh, the whole suite end-to-end. -end. And that's pretty powerful. Why? Because users are going to see the same thing whether they're coming from a smartphone or whether they're coming from a PC or a Mac. 
So if you if if you think you're thinking to yourself, what does X1 actually look like in reality? That's actually a very good question that you're asking yourself. So what I'm going to do very shortly and very briefly is I'm going to just put myself on mute. I'm going to then play a very short uh, case study video, and then we'll dissect that very briefly, and then we'll move forward. So just bear with me for one moment. Okay, so I'm just going to be playing the, the video and then I'll come back. Glass manufacturing, coal mining, and ship building are the economic cornerstone of Sunderland for as long as I can remember. It's a strong industrial heritage that goes back generations. That's what my grandfather did, that's what my father did. That's what I did until I ended my second career. When industry began to decline in the 80s, we really had no choice but to do something radical. And that we did. We decided that technology was the way to transform Sunderland and power our citizens and allow them to compete in the 21st century and transform government services at the same time. Now, that's the same race. Over 3,000 Sunderland employees can work from anywhere. Day or night, we can act on the spot. And we can adhere to our strict government security standards, regardless of the device we use. In a time when services have been cut everywhere, our population is experiencing better public services than ever before. And our community is actually thriving as a result. Schools, libraries, human services, children's centres. The cost effectiveness has been tremendous. Advocating technology as the basis of economic growth has attracted global businesses to Sunderland. With over 100 software companies relocating here, we've done more than just back up. We went from an economic disadvantage to a world-class leader in digital technology. And it was enabled in no small way by Citrix. Okay. So obviously that was a very short video that actually demonstrates some of the power behind what Cetrix technology can actually leverage and do in context of obviously delivering in the, your next generation potential workspace, and that's obviously independent power by X1. So if you if you haven't got a feel or an understanding for what X1 potentially may look like in reality, it's essentially it's a customized branded experience which is based upon your organization's individual needs and or requirements. So it doesn't make a difference if I uh, have two organizations, A and B, uh, and I come from a variety of different devices. The key thing is to make sure that they look and feel the same no matter what I come in from, and also giving me the ability to access my resources under demand 24-7, whether those be native mobile installed applications, whether I'm just controlling the device, whether I'm actually just delivering out Windows applications or a virtual desktop. And the key thing also around the Citrix solutions is we are secure by design. Why? Because depending on what we're attempting to deliver or do, we either sandbox those applications and encrypt the data within that as well, or we're just delivering out resources from the data center where it's just pixel changes. So that means if the device is either lost or stolen, a couple of things can happen. Either we could obviously do a, a wipe of that device and when it comes back online, the data is removed. Or likewise, if it's leveraging using Zen Mobile, they would need to connect back to your organization's infrastructure to retrieve a token once it's authenticated to obviously open up any application or any data sets. In terms of they were just getting Windows applications and desktops, that, that, that is irrelevant because there's no data stored on the device. In the context of ShareFile, we can do a very similar thing as well. If it doesn't connect back in within a certain number of days, obviously the poison pause in, then in effect and obviously any data within that container is then obviously lost and destroyed automatically. So we take a look at uh, something we call the mobile workspace in terms of the vision of the concept. We touched on uh, the user side of things, so obviously enabling X1 experience first. Now let's take that in context and actually have a look and see how X1 actually fits into the mobile workspace and actually where the vision of where Citrix is and it has been for a long time and where a lot of organizations still may be today. 
in terms of what we call yesterday, the older ways of working, typically most people are bound to an office, uh, potentially wired into a, a thin client or even a fat client machine that's wired. You typically bound to the office, so that means you have to be in the office between nine and five or say nine and six. You have a telephone on your desk and potentially you don't have a mobile phone. Whereas in reality, if you if you look at uh, what a lot of people are looking for today is they're looking for a more mobile workspace. So that means that they have the ability to work from any time, any location, from anywhere. Uh, they want it to be personal. They want to obviously be wireless, which means they want to be mobile. Uh, freedom of choice potentially at devices. They also don't want to have to be contacting IT to gain access to any type of resource. They just want to be able to go into an enterprise app store, select a resource, whether it needs approval or not is irrelevant because we can wrap workflows around that to say if a user is requiring access to a particular resource, we can kick off a workflow so that can be potentially sent to the alarm manager to IT then go through approval processes and we can put different controls around all of that. If we actually look, take a take a more of a, a broader view slash look into a mobile workspace, it's made up of many different things. Uh, it doesn't have to be everything you see on screen in front of you now. So obviously, it's going to enable things like workforce mobility. So that means you can work from any time, any way. It also enables flexible working. So an example that I use myself when I talk about uh, Citrix mobile workspace is this: my fiance has got stage five kidney disease, um, and sometimes she is not uh, very well. Uh, so sometimes I need to take a bit of time out of my own personal life, uh, yes, my working life, and actually help and assist her or even help my little one because I've got a two and a half year old daughter. So what that may mean is I then either flip across from my laptop or my Mac onto my phone and actually continue to work or across onto my tablet where I can actually look after either one of them and then obviously within an hour or two, potentially after taking a longer lunch break, actually switch across to actually leveraging and using my PC or Mac again uh, connected to my virtual desktop because I prefer to use the keyboard and mouse, but I have the option to flip between them. We've obviously touched on the, the actual app stores themselves. Ne next generation workspaces, so that can be anything that your organization dictates, dictates in terms of what it's going to potentially look like. So the simple analogy I tend to use when we're actually on a webinar like this is if you actually Google uh, and have a look at Apple's new uh, headquarters that they're opening up, likewise Facebook's new headquarters that have just recently opened up, or even Apple's. In terms of in terms of the context of Citrix, we actually have the very similar premise uh, within the UK. So what we did is we went through an exercise last year where we actually halved the the sales floor area, as an example, by 50%, and we changed to leveraging using uh, next generation workspaces, so essentially eating uh, eating our own words. And it's actually proved to be very useful, very powerful, more collaborative, and we actually get a lot more done. Obviously, I think supporting any type of devices, so that doesn't necessarily have to be uh, bring your own, that could potentially be choose your own device as well. I think the key elements there is around any device. Now, if anyone's familiar with the term Generation Z, or if you're not, I suggest you, as an example, go onto the BBC website and just type in Generation Z. What Generation Z is all about is all those individuals that have come through uh, the school system, education system, leaving university or leaving school today, they expect to be able to bring in their mobile device and actually leave it to potentially use that for the purposes of work. In terms of security compliance and business continuity in the context of a mobile workspace, well, because we're making everything highly available within the data center, potentially across two different data centers or more, it means that users, if something had to happen to your head office, a natural disaster, whatever that may be, you could potentially tell your staff, please don't come into the office. Uh, you can send them out a text message, uh, likewise also an email to say, please don't come into the office. Please work remotely from home until we resolve the issue, whatever that may be. Maybe it's just a power cut to the building or, the, or, the, or your head office is inaccessible due to, as an example, strikes with the London Underground or potentially dumps, uh, large dumps of snow in that particular area, whatever it may be. Essentially, a mobile workspace is going to seamlessly and securely unite your applications, your, your data and your services on any device over any network or any cloud. So I use the context any cloud. Why? Because it could be your own organization's cloud. It could be where you farmed out part of your infrastructure to an infrastructure as a service provider, i.e. AWS, or potentially uh, to a managed services ISP, as an example. If we take a very quick brief look at the actual the components that make up uh, Citrix Mobile Workspace. Um, so on the far left hand side you can see a number of users are connecting in through a number of different devices over the internet. So the key messaging there obviously being over any device, any network, any time, any way. Then obviously hitting a net scanner which is obviously going to make sure that the user's experience comes first. 
it's seamless, and transparent, but also more importantly, secure. So in other words, we can actually stop people from actually entering the organization's infrastructure uh, with our smart access technology based upon the geographic location, uh, or we can even do go as far as actually doing a scan of their machine. Obviously, they need the agent plugged in uh, to say, do they have an antivirus? Is the antivirus up to date? Is the firewall on? Is the machine actually patched? If certain criteria is not met, we can obviously then disable them access uh, to accessing any resources. We can effectively stop them in the DMZ before they access any internal trusted resources. What we could also do is if you have multiple branch offices, we could obviously accelerate traffic between those different branch offices offices and your head office or even across your two different data centers for replication of any form of uh, uh, WAN traffic or even uh, optimization of that traffic leveraging using our collaborative technologies. Then obviously obviously behind that what we have is we have the ability then to deliver Windows applications and desktops um, <clears throat> to your users. So they could be even they could be anything like Windows 8 to 1, uh, potentially moving forward as we do those release cycles, Windows 10, obviously Windows Server 2012 giving the ability to deliver hosted shared desktops, likewise also published applications. But we also have this notion and this ability to actually track and manage the user's experience through something we call HDX Insight. So it is a separate appliance that would essentially uh, is hooked up to the network that can actually give us end-to-end -end visibility in terms of where users connecting in from uh, to the edge of your network and then from the edge of your network all the way back into your organization's infrastructure so that users, uh, when they have a problem, the help desk can actually have a look and see, well, potentially Joe Bloggs is connecting in. The reason why they have a very bad user experience is they're connecting in a, a wireless connection that has a lot of a lot of jitter network uh, issues. Potentially, they're in Starbucks. The recommendation is to find an alternative wireless hotspot or move over to 3G or 4G to potentially resolve the issue. Now, if it was from the edge of the network internally, potentially that issue may actually it could be high latency. Further investigations have actually shown that there's nothing wrong with the servers on the back end, so potentially it's a network-related issue. Or potentially the reason why it's uh, slow is because there's failover happening because potentially part of your storage array has gone down or you've lost a couple of your hosts. So essentially trying to isolate where the, issues, uh, where the issue may potentially lie. And then obviously uh, we can obviously deliver out any of our uh, any of our capabilities around mobility, whether it be following me data with ShareFile, so accessing internal trusted uh, SharePoint sites or even existing uh, file shares on the back end, uh, all the way through to delivering native mobile applications through our work suite applications, which we can then sandbox and completely safely secure uh, all the data within those applications as well. So if we actually take a look at what, are, what essentially what fundamentally are the options that we have. We have the ability to obviously deliver applications and virtual desktops uh, safely and securely. We have the ability within Citrix to obviously deliver what we call something called desktop player. So we do have a tech preview for desktop player for Windows. That essentially is where we have a secure virtual machine image on the back end, which we then can deliver down to our users. That can be obviously stored on that machine locally. So if they were completely offline, meaning that I have no internet connection in any way, shape, or form. Or essentially, think of it like this, I'm on the London Underground, uh, and I'm in the, sitting in the middle of the tunnel. You could potentially boot that up and still access all your applications and your data. When you connect back to your wireless connection, obviously the data can then be synced back up to, the organi to your organization's uh, network and everything can be saved. We also now have the ability to give you a choice in terms of desktop delivery, so we now obviously support Linux-based desktops, so we support SUSE and Red Hat Enterprise. The reason why we've gone down the Enterprise route is for obvious reasons, so that you obviously have the ability to have those trust and uh, agreements with those vendors to make sure that if you need any help or assistance, you can obviously obtain that quite happily through either Red Hat or SUSE. Then finally, obviously, Delivering Windows applications, sorry, uh, Windows desktop to a user that could be server-based or that could be a Windows Windows desktop operating system. We can also obviously deliver just the applications to the users, so those could be natively installed Windows applications, sorry, natively installed mobile applications, or they could be published Windows applications, or they could even be Windows applications that have been refactored and repurposed using HDX Mobile to make them more touch-friendly and usable on their point device. But what we can also do is we can obviously deliver these applications directly into your virtual desktop. So essentially it's completely seamless and transparent to the users. So it doesn't make a difference whether they're using the virtual desktop or the application, it's interchangeable between the user. So depending on what tasks they need to do, they can either potentially just use the Windows application or just the desktop and vice versa. 
So just a quick summary. So essentially, what is the Citrix mobile workspace going to actually allow and enable us to do? It's going to obviously improve pro, uh, employee productivity, deliver a high definition, high definition user experience. It's going to enable you to mobilize and empower your entire workforce or workforces. It's going to give you the ability to access secure applications and content. And obviously, it's a very flexible and unified solution whereby you can control, you can you can put constraints around how much flexibility versus security you want and openness versus not being so uh, not being uh, so open, being more secure, but still making sure, making sure that we can hit home with it, what we call that X1 experience. So experience first for the users. So I'm just going to jump into a few demonstrations very quickly. Uh, so the first of which is, this is the new Citrix receiver, which you can see I've branded up as Bytes. So I've used the actual colors to highlight the apps. I put their logo in. You can see when I actually do a search, it's quite uh, quite clever. It actually limits the search to what I'm actually looking for instead of just giving instead of just giving me a search result. Um, <clears throat> I also have this notion of app bundles, where you can see in the background there, I've got Windows uh, applications, I've got sysadmin applications, so I have the ability to add applications dynamically for that whole actual application bundle. So think of it like as a, in context of the Apple App Store, we have the ability to add multiple applications. You can do now do the same thing with the receiver. So you can put collectively put all your applications into an application bundle, and the user can tap and add those all at once. So it could be say Office. 2010, Office 2013, or you could lump the whole lot together. Now, if you didn't want to go down with that approach of actually having uh, subscription-based uh, follow me apps, you could go with a static approach where you have the ability to actually leverage and use uh, files and folders, or you can have a blend between files and folders and subscription-based uh, follow me apps, which you have now with Storefront 3, so we enable all three options. If a user was to log in through just a web interface, um, so what that means is, I don't mean actual Citrix web interface, I actually mean uh, an internet browser. So as you can see, I've completely branded this one up, so you can see the parts logo. I've just put a Citrix logo in the background, but essentially I can customize that whole experience. I can change the look and feel. So you see again, I have the logo and the colors, but I can actually more importantly change the look and feel here according to what I need in terms of my organization's branding requirements potentially. So it doesn't make a difference when I go to the favorites, desktops, and apps. I get the exact same look and feel. As you can see, I've actually added an, a new tab in this particular one where you see my X1 apps. But if I go to the different app bundles, it doesn't make a difference. I still have the exact same look and feel. I also have the ability to add in third-party notices if I want a uh, message of the day as well. Uh, there's many different things you can actually do with Storefront 3. So you can actually seriously enhance the user's experience end-to-end. So again, if I do a search, you'll see it's very dynamic and very fluid and compared to what you saw with the receiver. There's no technical difference between them. You can see I get the application that I'm looking for quite happily and easily. Uh, activate would just obviously give a configuration file to receiver. I could potentially change and enable uh, my password through receiver for web if I wanted to. As, as you saw there, add third-party notices and then obviously log off. So if I actually put the two side by side, so if I actually put an internet browser and the actual new Citrix receiver side by side, and I actually have a look at the two life for life, you'll see the, if I take both the windows out, so the Citrix receiver window and the internet browser window, there's no technical difference between the two. It looks slightly different because of the real estate that I've given it in terms of the screen size. Now the same thing will be true for a native mobile device or a tablet. I will just either see one or more application bundles or three or four or maybe one or two applications listed around doing the search, and that's purely based upon the real estate of the screen that I've actually provided, or I've actually got based on my smartphone or my tablet. Now, the other thing we talk about is uh, what we call the X1 mouse. So, yes, it is a mouse, but it's actually quite powerful. Why? Because we can actually leverage and use the mouse, tether it up to an iOS device, and actually use it with receiver. So, when we're actually access, accessing a Windows application, or a virtual desktop, we actually can actually leave it and use that mouse, interact with that Windows application or desktop like we natively would through a, a Mac or a PC, or even a workstation or a thin client on my desk. So what that means is you don't have to carry around a, a laptop anymore. You can just take a, an iPad with you, your iPhone, and obviously your X1 mouse. So this actual recording, I've actually delivered this from Amsterdam to myself in London. Uh, using a prototype mouse. I've tested the scenario of actually leveraging and using an X1 mouse uh, in the city of London, because uh, I actually live in the city of London uh, myself. But I've tested this at quite a few partner sites whereby um, I've actually taken my iPhone, I've tethered my iPad to my iPhone, and then I've connected using the X1 mouse to my iPad and actually connected to my Citrix virtual desktop. 
which is actually hosted in Amsterdam and it works quite happily and quite nicely. Another potential access method that you obviously can get with Citrix Workspace Suite is the ability to actually access your virtual applications and desktops through just a browser. Yes, uh, you, you're correct in what, uh, what you just heard, just a browser. What that means is I don't need to install anything. So you can see I've just logged in and you'll notice it's opened up a new tab and it's actually starting an application that I already, uh, already had it open when I logged off. But I'm also at the same time adding another another session which is a Windows Server 2012 desktop. And, uh, this is this isn't the new storefront. This is the storefront two three. So there's no branding in this particular example. So I do apologise for that. I just ran out of time to be able to brand that. But you can see it's connected to my actual Windows application on the back end, and I can actually leave it and use that directly within the browser. Now a couple of things to note is we actually sandbox receiver inside the actual browser itself, which needs to be HTML5 uh, compliant. Uh, once it's actually done, I can then access my Windows applications and desktops, but more importantly, when I disconnect from my session, it will close all the tabs. Likewise, also, nothing is actually kept uh, or stored on the device because it's sandboxed. When it means the session is closed, it's actually destroyed along with all the data. So that means we don't leave any residue behind. This is not. This should not be confused with the actual receiver you have for Chrome, where some people tend to confuse the two. This is something we call the HTML5 receiver. So it's available on IE, Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. So as you can see there, um, I was accessing Windows Server 2012 desktop, and when I log off, you'll notice it disconnects the second tab, and it disconnects all my sessions. So it means I've left nothing on the endpoint device. And finally, just a very short demonstration around uh, enterprise mobility management, which is again part of Workspace Suite. You can see I've just trimmed this where it's actually installing some applications for me. What I'm going to do in the interim while those applications are installing, I'm going to download and access a uh, receiver. You'll notice I tapped on a, a, a resource from the springboard of the device. I haven't been asked to put in my, any of my user details. Why? Because Works Home is actually taking care of all the heavy lifting for the user in terms of authenticating the user, establishing the session, collecting all the information from ZenApp and Zen Desktop, injecting all of that into a receiver, then obviously starting my session automatically and dynamically. Now you can control the user experience in terms of how this actually works and feels and functions. It's entirely up to you how you set this up. So here is now an example of me actually accessing my corporate intranet site, so intranet.citrix.lab. The top level domain is not readable on the internet, however you can see it's accessible through a receiver connected to a virtual desktop. Um, <clears throat> you also notice down in the bottom left hand corner we've got this uh, slightly different view and look compared to Windows 7 when I enable uh, what we call our touch base uh, interface which means that we can actually enable users to have a more touch-based interface when they connect and we can sense whether they're coming in from a touch-based device and obviously put another user uh, um, layer between where the user is connecting in from and what the user is actually seeing so we can actually optimize the user experience. That means that instead of expecting a mouse, we can translate finger movements or into actually mouse clicks essentially whether it be a left click, right click. So as you can see as an example, I've actually connected to Windows uh, session, I was, uh, had a notepad opened up, connected to Office and obviously import an application directly from the internet. And then obviously I can save that document and view that at another, at another point in time. So what I'll do now is I'll just disconnect from my session. And then very quickly what I can do from here, so within the actual uh, store itself, I could click on a resource or I can more importantly just tap on a resource, which I've just done now, from the springboard of the device to access that same internal intranet site, leveraging using something we call Citrix Works Web, which will automatically authenticate the user, establish a micro VPN, then obviously connect me back to my internal trusted resources. So I, d I don't believe in having the perfect demo so where you think, see things like that where it actually is timed out. It's going to go back to Works Home, challenge, authenticate itself, and then flip me back to the application, which you just saw it do now. But now you see I can actually access the same application uh, through a native mobile device. I didn't have to put in any convoluted username, password, or two-factor PIN. Uh, it automatically signed me in based upon the authentication timeout policies that were enforced by the mobility admin on the back end. Now you can choose to say whether users actually can access applications uh, for a certain limited period of time or you could let that and say that for up to 24 hours. We also have the, the ability and the capabilities to actually download and even save pages offline uh, through our works, mail, uh, uh, works web client, which means that you can actually store documents securely inside the actual web browser itself to, to either be viewed at a later time as a preview or to open it up in a different application type to actually potentially edit, which I'll do now. So we'll click on edit 
And then what it will do is it will flip across to something we call Works Web, which gives you the ability to actually uh, view and look at office-based documents and do just generic-based editing that you potentially want to do on a native mobile device. So I could highlight the actual image itself and I can move it around, as you can see on screen now. I can then obviously select some text and I can do many, many different things. I can insert some images, I could change the font type, make it bold, make change the text color, all those sorts of things. In terms of what you want to do on the endpoint device, I think that's subject in terms of context of what the document is and what, what the intention and the goal is. You still will have a better use experience in terms of using Office-based applications that are delivered through traditional Office. Why? Because that's where the richness of those applications actually comes from. Whereas on native mobile devices, those are starting to change more and more as, you, as we see Microsoft moving into delivering Office-based applications onto iOS and Android devices. So I think that will start to get better and better as we move forward. Um, and finally, just to wrap things up, so we, get, we have a few promotions around works, uh, Workspace Suite, uh, the first of which is the Trader promotion. Uh, keep in mind that these are due to expire this year on the 30th of September. Um, so essentially, you can save up to 70% uh, of your actual... <coughs> Excuse me, so up to 70% uh, of your entire Zen desktop platform or Zen mobile enterprise in terms of the product portfolios. The full details are available at workspace uh, trade up, so, sorry, citrix.com forward slash workspace trade up. And the other promotion we have on offer is 50% of Citrix Workspace Suite. Uh, if you have any uh, competing solutions around VMware, Mobile Line, Good, uh, and all those sorts of other vendors out there. Obviously, it does require a validation and checking, but once that has been done, essentially, obviously, those will then kick in. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. I'm going to flip back uh, to Amy and the team at Barts for some Q&A, and then we'll wrap up and finish, it, finish up. Amy, over to you, or Jamie. Brilliant. Thanks, LJ. Um, right, I'm just going to pop back to my screen. Okay, so um, as mentioned previously, if you do have any questions, uh, just pop those in the questions box, um, which is just um, at the right-hand side of your screen there, um, and I'll read those out shortly. Um, okay, we already actually have a couple of questions here. Um, so there's a question sure, from, sure. from Jason. Um, he said, how would the cloud bridge help when the desktop is hosted in the UK and the branch office is in Hong Kong? Okay, um, so essentially, fundamentally, Jason, what, what we need there is we need to have a branch repeater on either end. So you need to have a branch repeater sitting inside your data center where your virtual desktop is being uh, delivered from. You're also going to need a branch repeater, uh, sorry, not a branch repeater, a cloud bridge at the receiving end, whether that be in, say, uh, an office uh, to obviously accelerate that traffic. Then obviously what we do is we do some very clever dedupe and obviously traffic and WAN optimization to actually make sure the experience comes first. So anything that we don't, we can deduplicate and do some other, other things with, we'll do that, as well as obviously accelerating the RCA protocol. The other thing we can obviously do is if if the if it's not an actual office and it's just individual users, you can actually leave it to use a plugin, which will then simulate what a basic VPX would do or a physical appliance would do, but it's strongly only recommended for very small use cases in terms of where the office is less than 10 users. When you start to get about to about 10 users, depending on the use case or requirements, you will leave it and need a cloud bridge appliance of some description. Typically, it's going to be a virtual based so that you don't have one machine in the office potentially doing all the ground work of uh, obviously accelerating all the traffic and then broadcasting and repeating. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, LJ. Um, so we have another question here. This one's from Paul. Um, he's asked, um, how do you help organizations meet the requirement of Microsoft licensing in relation to the number of devices permitted to access the Microsoft de desktop? e.g. the capability of absence? So that's a very good question, Paul. Typically, uh, I, don't, I don't tend to answer those type of, types of questions in a public forum. i tell you why, because it's a conversation that's typically bound to a customer. It's also dependent upon where licensing is in terms of Microsoft. It typically isn't so much of a Citrix-related issue. It's more of a Microsoft-related issue in the context of licensing and how they actually license uh, per user or per device. That does continually change, so that is definitely, I think, a topic that can be taken and tabled offline with myself and Bart, so we can look forward to see how we can actually potentially help you. Okay, thanks, LJ. 
Any other questions, Amy? Um, right, I do have one here. Got it? Um, okay, I've got one here sure. from Arta. He said, uh, should we expect improvements in Citrix monitoring? With Citrix Zen up 6.5, we got Edge Site Server 5. As we have platinum licenses, oh, sorry. Um, as so, very, very, very good question. Very good question. Uh, so, sorry, what was the lady or gentleman's name? Um, so this is Arta. There's, he's actually got some more Arta. Um, information sure, more to the question. Um, he says that they have platinum licenses. Um, with Zen Desktop 7, um, Edge Site is gone, and he can only see Edge Site name in Director, and it's not. Real edge site, HDX and okay. ZenApp require platinum licenses for Netscaler, and it's quite a so, 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 very good question. Uh, I get that quite a bit. So I think between Zen Desktop 5.6 and ZenApp 6.5, when we transitioned and moved across to what we call Zen App slash Zen Desktop 7X, where we unified the architecture. We also took that opportunity to do a lot of changes, uh, not just in the architecture side, but also how we do monitoring and support. So what you'll notice and find is you don't do an, an extra installation of ed, an edge site agent that is actually all built into the VDA. Likewise, also UPN and many other things as well. What you will find as well is that you actually have, excuse me, uh, HR slash director are one and the same thing within reason, so I'll touch on the differences in a moment. Um, essentially, you get director, which gives you the ability to look at user sessions for in any edition. Depending on the edition version, will give you the ability to see data for a certain period of time. Thereafter, grooming may be quicker or shorter. If you have platinum, you can do some changes to obviously enable and make sure that data persists for a lot longer. Typically, we don't recommend more than 90 days. Why? Because the data grows quite large quite quickly, and you may potentially not realize how quickly it's growing, but you can obviously do those adjustments. In terms of the edge site functionality, so you're probably looking at more the capacity planning sort of side of things. That is still being scheduled and being re-architected and reworked. There is some basic functionality in there today that you do get, but it's nowhere near the amount that you typically would get with the edge sites, uh, the previous versions. The, other, the third thing to look at is we've actually created new, something new called HDX Insight, which essentially is where we have app player collectors that are pushed up to uh, the Netscaler Insight appliance, which then do the number crunching and give you the deep visibility end to end across your network from where the user is connecting into the edge of the network and then from the edge to the infrastructure on the back end. That does require additional licensing. There is a bit of work as it to be done in the middle in the middle space, so please watch the space as we start to move forward. Thanks, LJ. Um, so, Art has uh, got another question um, regarding Zen Desktop 7X. Um, he said, we are using, using a number of zones in one farm. Should we consider creating the same number of Zen Desktop 7X farms based on Citrix zones uh, should be replaced by farms? Okay, so I think first thing first, uh, I think that's definitely a conversation to be tabled and taken offline. Why? Because depending on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve is going to be different from customers A, B, C, D, all the way through to Z. But just to give a better general guidance, so if you look at the context of IMA versus FMA, they're completely different. Uh, the way that you actually carve things up is, co is completely separate and co completely different where traditionally if you have uh, different the simplest way to describe it is this, if I have uh, two zones uh, per country, you may want to consider just having one site, but that also depends upon your connectivity. Uh, if you want to have high availability between multiple different sites and manage those together, again, there are some garden, there's a lot of gardens that needs to be taken into account. We are actively looking at doing what you described and asked for in uh, the next future coming releases as they are coming through. Um, so it is something we're keeping our eye on the ball on in terms of what we're going to bring out, how we're going to bring that out. If you take a look, uh, I know it's not the answer you want to hear today, but if you take a look at blogs at Citrix.com and you just type in uh, searching for high, avail high availability for FMA architecture, there's quite a bit of guidance that's been given in, this, in the public forum around how to actually achieve and do that through some of our consultants, both based in the US uh, or the Americas and also within EMEA. Thanks, LJ. Um, so I think we have one more question. So this one's from Richard. 
Um, what sort of security should be consideration if a vendor is hosting a financial application remotely at their location and pu publishing it to a client's desktop at a different location? So very, very good question. So we've got a, I think one of the more well-known ones that kind of touches on that within reason is Bloomberg. I think they call it Bloomberg Desktop One or Desktop, whereby Bloomberg actually publishes a virtual desktop to users to actually do trading on. So in the context of what you're trying to aim and do, there's a couple of things you could do. You obviously you want to make sure that your data center is ISO 27001 slash PCR DSS compliant. Uh, obviously, make sure that you've got all the rules and checks and balances in place there first before you deliver anything out. You potentially also want to make sure that in terms of security, you want to ensure that the, the, where the user is connecting in from, whether that be through the ASML file receiver or through just a native receiver, uh, you probably want to make sure that the connection between that and where the virtual desktop is sitting or that application is completely secured, so TLS as opposed to SSL uh, v3. So we've got a, a very good blog article on that which I'll put into the deck later on that actually covers off how to ensure that once traffic comes into the gateway, we can persist with that secure connection time from the gateway through to the virtual delivery agent on the back end hosting your virtual application and desktop. The other thing you definitely want to strongly consider is on the endpoint is if those are third-party contractors, should we actually enforce that, uh, require them to actually have another agent installed so we can do a scan of that device to make sure that it's got an antivirus, make sure that antivirus is up to date, uh, do a device identity check, or do we just uh, forget that and we'll just deliver out everything to third-party contractors as uh, as the clientless method, so leveraging using the ASML file receiver, which means everything is sandboxed inside Chrome, IE, Firefox, or Safari. When they log out or disconnect their session, everything is then destroyed. So you have a couple options there. Okay, thank you, LJ. Um, so I think that's all the questions we have for no today. Oh, um, so Martin um, has just asked if, um, if if we have any recommendations for Citrix tutorials and information. Uh, Martin, if you could just expand upon what you mean by tutorials, it would be a little bit more helpful, if you wouldn't mind, please. Okay, I'll just wait for his response. <clears throat> <clears throat> I mean, as always, you, uh, so there's a, there is a feedback form at the end of the webinar, so if there is anything in particular you're interested in, you can pop that in there and we'll be more than happy to, to follow up with a call um, to provide you with, with some more information. I, th I think just, just general guidance, if, we just t if nothing's coming from Martin, is this. Uh, yeah, we do what? make things very simple and easy. It's coming to call. I'm oh, sorry, I was just going to say Martin just said he, he'll last later. He's, as he's okay, well, let me, let me try. okay, well, let me just try and answer it in a general broad, broader term. Um, so I talked about X1, so experience first, right in the beginning. So what does that mean uh, in terms of a tutorial of accessing Citrix? It should be as simple as this. It should be as simple as a new start on boards or you have new users in your organization accessing a Citrix infrastructure. You tell your users, go to, go, to the, go to your app store and download receiver. Now, when I've talked to people, they say, well, that's difficult. I don't want them to do that. I always turn it and flip it on its head and I say, no, it's not. Think about this. If a new application, which already is out today, uh, WhatsApp came out that enables you to send messages, send audio messages, take video, send videos to family across the, across the globe or even in country, the first thing people do is they what's that application called? They go into the app store, they download and they figure out how to use it. Now the same thing is true for Citrix. You essentially just download uh, the receiver. You then are simply prompted to enter. You should set this up, so this is dependent upon how Citrix is put in. Uh, whoever's putting it in should enable DNS SLV records. Uh, so what that means is the user just has to put in an email address. I could then auto resolve where everything is for the user. They will then be challenged for their domain username and password, potentially also a, a token for two factor authentication. Once that has then happened, the, their store will then be set up on their receiver and they will, they will then be able to access any resources that you publish to them. 
Um, so that could be Windows applications and desktops. And moving forward, as we move through into the second half of the, this year, this will be where we merge uh, works home and receiver together. You'll also be able to get native mobile applications through that same store as well. So I hope that answers your question in a more broader sense. Martin. Thanks, LJ. Um, so Richard uh, has just asked if there is a URL um, that he can access for the security consideration explained. Could, uh, maybe we can add that to the to the email that we're recording later. Yeah. So Richard, I'll, there is a microsite. I don't remember it off the top of my head. I will put some extras in. Uh, I'll have a chat with Amy after this. I'll make sure I'll, I'll add a section right at the end of it called extras, and I'll put in all the extra bits. So the link link will be contained within that. Um, and, and would it also be okay, um, LJ, if we added the um, case study video as, as it was a bit kind of, the quality wasn't great? Yeah, sure. So the link to the case study video is actually in the slide deck as well. I've done that on purpose wow. just in case it never came across to everyone uh, quite smoothly. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so I think that's all the questions for today. Um, so LJ, thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to present the webinar today. And also thanks to everyone else for, for joining us today. Um, so as mentioned before, I will send you all um, a link this afternoon, which has the recording, the case study, um, any information you've asked for. Um, and also there, there will be a feedback form that, that pops up once the webinar is finished. If you would like any more information or if you'd like a call back from Bytes, um, please put that in there and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, or you can email Jamie, um, who was on the webinar earlier on, um, at jamie.wood at bytes.co.uk. Um, so once again, thanks everyone and uh, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Take care everyone.